You are listening to Arcane Carolinas, an exploration of the Carolinas' folklore, legends, myths, and modern weird. Each episode, we examine the historical context of our topic and aim to preserve some of the stories that help make this part of the world such a fascinating place. Hello and welcome to another episode of the 2022 Arcane Carolina's Spooky Spectacular. I'm your co-host, Charlie Mewshaw. I'm your other co-host, award-winning novelist, Michael G. Williams. And we are here today to talk to you about the folklore, legends, myths, and modern weird out of the Carolinas. Take it away, Michael, because I have no idea what you're talking about today. (laughs) (laughs) Today, we're going to talk about a legend from Polk County, North Carolina. And it is the legend of a historical figure named Witch Anne. (laughs) Which (laughs) Anne being the surname, which being the first name. (laughs) I mean, you know, it's more like an honorific. Okay. And and appropriate to the spooky season, I mean W-I-T-C-H, not (laughs) W-I-C-H. Which Anne? I don't know. There's, who's on first? <laughs> right. There's a whole routine that we could have done there about right. which Anne, you know, which Anne. Right. So. <laughs> it's not vaudeville. <laughs> in 2010 or 2011, a local author in Polk County, North Carolina, published what he himself described as historical fiction based on a real legend from Polk County that he had grown up hearing about a figure named Witch Anne. And that novel is titled Witch Anne. And the author is this guy named M. Willard Pace. I really thought you were going to say Witch Anne. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really funny. I would. <laughs> Pace is a native of that region in general, and he said in interviews at the time that this was an artifact from his family's lore that had been passed down to him when he was a little kid. Okay. And we're going to do our usual thing of we're going to start with the legend, and then I'll talk about the historical research afterwards. Nice. According to the legend, a person named Ann Biddy was born near midnight on Halloween in 1844, (laughs) and you can already kind of see some embroidery. Right. <laughs> right. But Anne Biddy was born on Halloween in 1844 on a mountain that is called Wildcat Spur in Polk County. That sounds totally believable. Yeah. Wildcat Spur is a peak in one of the most rural regions of Polk County, North Carolina. Even today, this is one of the most rural, remote regions of a pretty remote place. Okay. According to the story, Anne's mother, Sally, died in childbirth, and Anne considered this later in her life to be sort of the first of countless troubles that were visited upon her. And as a result of that, she was raised by her father, this guy named P.D. Biddy, and a great aunt who was named Issa. And Anne's father remarried. He married a woman named Hassie, H-A-S-S-I-E. But Anne's great aunt, Issa, stayed close to the family and was really a big part of bringing her up. Yeah, this all sounds reasonable. No, oh, yeah, totally. Anne was also very close with her stepmother, you know, counter to the, the sort of like Cinderella story of the wicked stepmother and all that sort of stuff from fairy tales. Anne was very close to Hassie and, and considered her a very important part of her life. According to an article in the Tryon Daily Bulletin in 2016, talking about the book and looking at some of the history behind the story, Anne in childhood had a black cat that followed her everywhere. Yes. It's a little detail that I love. (laughs) I have a black cat, so, you know. And she had three sheep. She had two white ewes and one black ram, which I love because it's Big Shades of the Witch, which is one of my favorite horror movies. Mm Mm-hmm. In this article, it said that people called her the black sheep because of that. And I don't know if that's embroidery or not, but I like that little detail. According to the story, when Anne was a child, she was bitten by a rattlesnake. And her father took her to a local Native American woman who was renowned as a healer in the community who's referred to as Lady Awata. O-W-A-T-T-A. And Awada was known as an herbalist. Basically, she was the community's doctor. But back in those days, that could very easily just be witch. <laughs> very much so. Because <laughs> they would just be, we're here using the magic herbs. I just yeah. picked them from over there. Witch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
So she used herbalism to treat the snake bite, saved Anne's life. And Anne became an admirer of Lady Wada and a student of her practices and her expertise. So she learned Native American herbalism and healing from Lady Wada, but she also learned techniques of what we would consider more Western medicine from Lady Wada, who knew how to do things like set bones, you know, and treat fevers. Eventually, Anne met and married a man named John Shepard, and she made a home sort of in the shadow of Wild Cat Spur, the way that the book describes it as in the clutches of Wild Cat Spur, on a ridge that came to be known as Anne Ridge. Over the course of her life, however, Anne lost almost everyone close to her just during childhood. Her mother at childbirth, then her great aunt Issa dies when she's a child. Then her stepmother Hassie, to whom she's very close, dies tragically in a wagon accident. The wagon hits a patch of ice that rolls over. Hassie is thrown from the wagon and dies instantly. Yeah. And even after she's married to John Shepard, her in-laws, to whom she's become very close, they die also in the 1860s, while Anne is still, you know, barely 20. As was the style at the time, everybody died. Pretty much. And according to the story, according to the legend, the death of her stepmother convinced Anne that she had been cursed and that she was bewitched herself. Okay. On top of all of that, Anne's husband, John, got conscripted and forced to go fight for the Confederacy. So at that point, it's the Civil War happening in Polk County, North Carolina, and she's on her own with her father up on Anne Ridge in this incredibly remote place with just nobody around. To make matters even worse, P.D., her father, gets murdered by a deserter who was hiding in the woods. I was like, by who? <laughs> there's nobody up there. Right. Who he happens across you know, while he's walking along mm -hmm. a nearby creek. And so her father is dead. And now Ugh. she's completely on her own. She is all alone on this place that is so remote that it is now named for her as the person singular who lives there. I mean, that part's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that part is cool. <laughs> so shortly after this, it's 1864, a man in the community, possibly a boy in the community, died because he was cutting down a tree and the tree fell on him. I shouldn't I, I shouldn't laugh, but I'm just picturing like a Looney Tunes like Right. Unfortunately it was not yeah. it was not that it was not like that. No, it was real. And so the kid dies and his father, distraught, accuses Anne of having killed the boy or caused the tree to fall on him by witchcraft. Now, the legend doesn't say why the guy would accuse Anne of this other than that she was a pretty ripe target for accusations of witchcraft. She's a woman on her own. She lives in a very remote place. She knows herbalism. She knows healing. By this point, she has a reputation in the community as a healer, and people are coming to her for medical help and for treating illnesses and injuries because she's learned everything that Iwata knew. And she's the person who now knows how to like set a broken leg, and she's cured her father of pneumonia at one point. And so she has this reputation as somebody who knows these things. Some people are going to consider a little suspicious because they're ignorant. So this guy, Rufus Ruff, I can't wait to hear if that's a real name or not. Yeah. Rough. So he accused Anne of having used witchcraft to cause the tree to fall on his son. Mm -hmm. This other person in the community, this man named Eli Bailey, speaks out in Anne's defense and says, no, Anne is not a witch and she didn't cause this to happen. And he confronts Ruff about this. And Ruff's reaction to being confronted about it is to literally just pull a gun and shoot him right there on the spot. That's rough. I'm sorry leave that alone I, I did not mean that. I, it just came out i didn't even mean to do that but it was funny <laughs> wait hold on hold on, hold on. That, to say it different and make it like a uh like a bad 80s sitcom that's rough <laughs> by all accounts it was <laughs> and i mean that in both senses <laughs> But like, so now Anne is in this position where the only person who has spoken out in her defense is murdered for it, which is not a good place to be. Mm -mm. And Anne reportedly was very angry over this and told somebody else in the community, I'll give them a reason to call me Witch Anne. Mm. Gonna go get my cat and my goats. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or sheep, whatever. <laughs> However... Every time Anne does anything to try to defend herself or defend her reputation or clear her name, it kind of backfires in this story. And the very first thing she does is try to go tell the family of Eli Bailey that he has been murdered by Ruff for speaking out in her defense. And the family doesn't believe her and doesn't believe that he was murdered for speaking out in her defense. They think that Anne killed him 
and that she's trying to cover for her. Which we have run into that in another story. Absolutely. Yes, we yes. absolutely have. Like historically, that did happen in another yes. story. Yeah. Yeah. In neighboring Rutherford County, historically, <laughs> yep. a person committed a murder and then tried to cover for it by leading the search for the person who killed the victim. Yep. So the family of the guy who's dead, of the like 15th person in this story who's dead, does not believe her. They do not believe that she's trying to help by pointing out that he was murdered by this guy. And word starts to spread in the community simultaneously that Eli Bailey, her defender's ghost, is riding around the countryside on a black stallion shouting that he was murdered by Witch Anne. Oh, man, it was really cool up until that part. I thought he was going to be like, I'm getting revenge. <laughs> <laughs> However, in the legend, that ghost is not a ghost. That is actually Anne herself on her own horse riding the countryside, warning people that she's a witch and they should stay away from her and stay away from her cabin because that's the only means of defense she's got. Wait, so hold on. So some people are saying that there's a like a headless horseman situation with dead guy number 15 riding around. Yeah. And then other people are saying that it's actually just Anne. Nobody's saying that it's Anne except Anne later reveals uh, that it's oh, her. OK. The entire time she realized that the, if anybody who in the community speaks out for her gets this killed. Is some Scooby Doo stuff. Does she have a ghost costume? Like, why do they think it's a ghost? <laughs> And I would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for you meddling kids. <laughs> Her father, and we kind of touched on this too in the Nobby episode, which happened two counties away but her father had built this device that was basically a bullhorn but that you sort of like wore it around your head and <laughs> call prey you could use it either to scare creatures away or to try to lure them mm -hmm. in the nobby episode we talked about how the guy who reported seeing nobby had predator collars that he had made yeah and, yep. and by collars i mean c-a-l-l-e-r-s yeah they they made a sound that would summon predatory animals because they would think that it was prey yep so she's got this device that her father had built to use as a hunting device and she's using it kind of like a megaphone as she rides around on horseback shouting the witch Anne killed eli bailey because like at that point everything about her reputation is starting to turn bad mm -hmm. and so her reputation is kind of her only weapon she just has to convince people in the community to leave her alone because she's now totally by herself up there in a time when that is really really bad yeah in the meantime however <laughs> She's also looking for an opportunity to prove that Ruff killed Eli Bailey. Sure. As one would. Yeah. And so she decides to go confront him about this, hoping that she can get him to say something. And when she goes to his home, it has burned down. That's not a good look. Yeah. Did you, uh, you watch the Righteous Gemstones, right? No, I haven't. I won't spoil anything. Okay. So she realizes at this point that anything she does, any sort of public life she has on her own is going to put her at greater and greater risk. All of her potential defenses have been taken away from her. Everybody who might defend her has either died or been killed for defending her. And the person that she was accusing of having actually been the murderer has now had their house burned down. And so she just sort of retreats up onto Wildcat Spur and just lives her life, hoping that things will get better. Yeah. I mean, there's not really any other options at this point. Yeah. And everybody in the community has sort of chalked it up to Anne Shepard is a witch and she used witchcraft to kill that kid who that the tree fell on. And she probably killed that guy who said that she wasn't a witch. And now there's his ghost riding around in the countryside shouting that she's a witch. And then the guy that she was trying to frame for murder, quote unquote, frame for murder, his house is burned down. So things are not good. Okay. But Pace himself said that this was, as I said, historical fiction based on a real story that had been handed down in his family. And at the time that it was published, he did a presentation of the Polk County Historical Society in 2011, where he read from the book, but also a member of the Polk County Historical Society read from what the Tryon newspaper described as a historical document. Cool. So I said, well, in light of that, let's go looking for the actual history. Yeah. The fact of the matter is I can find almost nothing related oh. to this. Like there is definitely no smoking gun proof sitting out there, but that in itself is not evidence that it's all made up or that the story didn't exist or that Pace had made this up himself. It's right there in the paper. The Polk County Historical Society had historical documents that complemented at least, if not to some degree, confirming the existence of this as oral tradition in this incredibly remote place. Oral history was very rarely written down. I mean, it's kind of in the 
title right there. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. And even the study of like even the academic pursuit of what's now called Appalachian studies, that didn't exist until the 1960s and 1970s. I just, for one of my classes, watched a documentary about the guy who is the grandfather of Appalachian studies as an academic discipline. He wrote his doctoral dissertation that sort of kicked off Appalachian studies as a field in 1961. So a hundred years before that, nobody is writing this stuff down. Nobody is paying nope. any serious attention to these types of stories. I read an article in a journal called Studies in Philology. Philology is the study of oral history and of like the language that gets used to pass stories on. It's not the study of guys named Phil. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's Uncle Phil. <laughs> <laughs> the article was published in 1919, but Studies in Philology is still published today. There was an issue published over the summer. It is in its 119th volume of publication. Ooh. And this article from 1919, though, is called Witchcraft in North Carolina. Ooh. It was sort of the closest that anybody at the State Library could get to helping me find anything on Witch Anne. And even in that article, the author specifically says he is not trying to create the definitive catalog of every report of witchcraft in the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. Instead, he's just sort of trying to describe the types of stories that are told in the Carolinas that are associated with witchcraft. Because we did one in Goose Creek or Bath. Yes. Near yeah. Oh, and we did another one, too. We, you did uh, Susanna Evans. Yeah, exactly. And neither yeah. of those get mentioned in this article. Interesting. And which Anne does not get mentioned either. I'd really hope that maybe there would, because it was so close to the time period, mm -hmm. maybe this, this would be an article where like this would get mentioned. And the article itself is very interesting and it's covered up in footnotes and a ton of it itself is almost a bibliography of research for its own show. But I was really hoping that I would see in there some mention of a story of which Anne in Polk County, North Carolina, but I never saw it there. The state library could not turn up anything on which hand. They told me they had never heard of this, could not find anything on any of these people, sent me some resources to try to do more research and were really helpful. But like they also could not turn up the smoking gun. And the Polk County Historical Society, ever since the beginning of the pandemic, has been sort of running on a skeleton crew. And so mm. they've not gotten back to me. They're not really able to help. And when I called the local library, I was told, yeah, they are trying to keep their head above water you know, and really trying to like, just make sure that the archives they have are protected and safe and attended to, but they can't run the sorts of events that they used to run as much as they did and things like that. So gotcha. like everybody else, they're just kind of trying to survive literally the experience that we're all in, but they have recordings of all of their presentations that they sell for five bucks pop. So I'm waiting to hear from somebody there Ooh. to see if maybe they have a recording of that 2011 talk. And if so, I will pay $5 and they will send me a DVD of it. Awesome. And the Polk County Library is also digging into this. And the reason that they're digging into it for me is because there's a publication called Polk County History that Pace mentioned in an interview as one of the books where this is recorded. Oh. But Polk County History is very hard to get your hands on. And I couldn't order a copy, or I should say I wouldn't order a copy because it's like 60 bucks for a used copy, you know. Mm. But there is a copy in the State Library and I need to get over there and look at it if they still have it in circulation. And in the meantime, the Polk County Public Library is going to go check it to see if which Ann is mentioned there. And if so, they'll scan it and send it to me. They'll scan that part of it and send it to me. Wow. But just like the story of Happy Dog, just like the ghost town of Goshen Hill, when I called the Polk County Library and said, I'm trying to research the legend of which Ann, he immediately knew what I meant. And he immediately knew the story. It's amazing. He even said, oh, there's a guy who wrote a book about it, and you should read that book. And he <laughs> described it as the definitive book on this story. Sure. So it's like, it's obviously, like, despite the fact that I can't find it written down anywhere, the fact that I can't find any of these people in any of the census records, nothing. Obviously, the story is actually in circulation in Polk County. Pace did not just make it up whole cloth for a book. No, this no. is a story that is in circulation in that area and is known in that community as part of the oral history tradition. And like I said, the fact is that stuff just does not get written down. That's why studies in philology gets published. There are a ton of stories in my own family that were only ever told. Like they were never written. Nobody has sure. ever written them down. And so like I've actually started trying to pull some of those stories out of my mother via email because literally those emails are the only written version of some of these. Yeah. When I had a great uncle 
who turned 90 in like, I don't know, 2008 or something like that. And my family had a birthday celebration for him. And I went back up the mountain to be there for it. And one of my aunts got him telling stories. And I just like set my phone on the table and said, is it okay for me to record? And did. And that's the only recorded version of like an hour and a half worth of family stories that we quote unquote all know, but Mm -hmm. nobody's ever bothered to write down. That's awesome. So I started looking into like, okay, well, would the cultural conditions of the time have supported this? You know, Mm -hmm. and in preparation for this episode, I ran across and really enjoyed reading this academic paper titled Barbara Powers, Witch or Myth, The Last Case of Witchcraft in South Carolina. It was published by the University of South Carolina Upstate Student Research Journal. It was a paper by three students, Brandon Smith, Bobby Joe Wimberly, and Courtney McDonald. And it talks about a different, totally different case of somebody being accused of witchcraft. But it also goes in depth into the social and economic conditions and sort of like the political conditions that nurture the sort of uncertainty and unrest and suspicion that are required for a witchcraft scare. Mm -hmm. And in it, they point out that basically the necessary ingredients are economic and political uncertainty Mm -hmm. and a really strong community divide around those issues. They specifically are talking about very early 19th century South Carolina and the political and economic divide between the quote unquote free farmers in the upstate and the plantation owners and plantations that were much wealthier in the coastal region. And like that's true across the southeast, but it was especially stark in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And so around the time of the War of 1812, those sorts of domestic, like internal political struggles really came to a head and created the right conditions for people to start accusing each other of things. Sure. You know, and like they talk about how political strife and repeated economic crises and the anxieties of war and all of that stuff put people of a mind to start looking for a solution to their problems that is A, closer to home and B, a lot easier to control. And all those were true in Polk County in the Civil War. The reductive version of history that we get where the South is this like monolithic political entity just is not accurate, especially not in the Highlands. And it was just it's never true of any people anywhere in any era. But like it's definitely not true of Polk County during the Civil War. Right. Literally, the story of Purgatory Mountain is about that sort of fact, you know, that sort of reality. And in the mountains of North Carolina and the upstate of South Carolina, there was a tremendous amount of political division and political violence between people who wanted secession and people who wanted to stay loyal to the union. You just never know. Even in the Goshen, in the ghost town of Goshen Hill, we talk about the fact that people were so worried. People were so scared already. Mm-hmm. The dude who landed his balloon <laughs> right. the morning after Virginia seceded is greeted by an armed mob who are convinced he's a spy. And the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So, like, I looked through the census records and the census records list, like, some of these names mm-hmm. or or really close names and they're at more or less the right times in more or less the right places but none of them mention Anne. none of them mention john her parents are not mentioned nothing i did find an issa biddy biddy was was Anne's maiden yeah. name but she's born too late to be Anne's great aunt but this is a really remote region and when i say remote i mean like super remote i cannot overstate how remote this is wild cat spur doesn't have a road going to it today hmm The nearest location you can find on Google Maps that you or I or anybody listening to this would be able to get to is a hiking trail called, and I am not making this up, called World's Edge. Hmm. There's a really neat site called Peak Visor, and I'll put a link to World's Edge on Peak Visor in the show notes for this. And what it does is it takes Google Maps and topological maps, Mm -hmm. and it sort of uses those to recreate a virtual experience of standing in a place. Oh, cool. And if you do that for Wildcat Spur, it is just nothing but hills and hollers in every direction. I mean, literally in every direction. You can rotate the camera 360 degrees, and it is just untouched wilderness. In every direction. That's awesome. So I have absolutely no trouble believing that a census taker in 1850 or 1860 would have utterly failed to make it to Wildcat Spur yeah. if they even bothered to try. And families reused names a lot at the time as sort of a form of memorial to the same way that they do now, yep. especially with women whose names might not be preserved otherwise in any other way. So finding an Issa Biddy who's born a couple of generations too late to be a great aunt kind of to me lends some credence to the story. Because I do think that a really important matriarchal figure in a family like this would be memorialized in some way. Yeah, this is great. I'm in. Yeah, 
I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> so like I wanted to get in touch with him while he'd pace for this episode, but I can't find a website for him. He did he's not on Facebook. There's no website for him as a writer. According to Goodreads, this is his one book. I don't know if that means that he has passed away or if that means he's just like he told his story and he's done. Either way, I was not able to get in touch with him. And if any of the additional sort of irons in the fire that I've got pay off, then I'll record a little addendum and drop it in after our conversation. But if what you hear listening to this after Charlie and I are done talking, is the outro music and that means that this is the kind of story that just vanishes unless somebody writes it down like every family has stories like this every community has has stories like this and they just never get preserved in any way when i was 14 my mother invited my father's mother and her remaining sisters to come to dinner one night and this was a huge deal they had not been in the same place in decades at that point and got them to just sit around telling stories just so that I'd be able to hear that. And nobody bothered to record it. I didn't bother to record it. And I would give anything to go back in time and just set a tape recorder out and, and make some sort of recording of it. And I've spent the intervening, you know, 35 years or so saying to myself, I really need to write down what I remember of those stories. But like, I've never bothered. I'm sitting here lecturing about how <laughs> bad it is right. that we don't write this stuff down and i haven't bothered to write it down so if you have stories like that in your family or your community like write them down do something with them i don't care type them up in a word document print it out stick it in a shoebox do anything like literally anything to help try <laughs> to preserve these because all we have now is a novel that the author himself says is historical fiction and the fact that everybody in polk county Everybody knows the story of Witch Anne, but nobody's bothering to write it down. Yeah, no, this is a good one, man. I like this story. I really like this a lot. I think it's believable. Yeah. Uh, it's very believable because it turns out there's actually no supernatural element whatsoever. It turns out that it's just somebody trying to defend herself in a hostile community. Well, that's a good one. Thank you for doing all this research. It seems like a pretty research intensive one. Historically speaking, witchcraft scares also a, a really important element of them is that there is a woman who is alone or on her own whether by circumstance or by choice and she's got land and she's got expertise in something and there are people who want to take that away from her and that's true across a ton of cultures but like i've spent weeks trying to find anything on this yeah. and just like can't dig up anything other than the fact that this novel exists but everywhere you look for information beyond this novel exists there's somebody saying everybody knows Everybody mm -hmm. knows the story. And the thing is, maybe everybody right now knows, but the people who know it, when they say everybody, that's a lot fewer people than they think. Cool. Well, thank you again. And uh, thank you to folks that are listening. We hope you enjoyed this. And I hope that there's an addendum. And if there's not, it's still a good tale. Yeah, it's a great story. It's like, it's really fun. The novel sounds like it's really fun. I think it's really interesting. The cover for the novel is a painting that Pace himself did decades before he ever wrote the book. And then when he wrote the book, he realized that that painting was of Witch Anne in his heart and that he really felt like that was an appropriate cover. I think that's a wonderful aspect to all of this. Yeah. I'm going to record on this computer. So when we recorded the first part of this, and some, I'm going to stitch these together somehow. I have no idea how. Sure. But I will somehow. I commented that it was entirely possible that that novel was the only written version of The Witch and... What? The Witch and... The, <laughs> the Witch... The Witch and I. <laughs> That's when Supernatural figures play uh, improv games. They, they play Witch <laughs> and... Uh, that's that's like their approach you know <laughs> nobody goes they try to get their friends to come out it's terrible nobody wants to watch a werewolf do improv no They're, come come to my we've been really working hard you should <laughs> definitely come on tickets are only five bucks please plus a two drink minimum <laughs> right <laughs> So I commented that, that that novel, Witch Anne, is, as far as I could tell, the only written version of the legend of Witch Anne. And that Alan at the Polk County Public Library has told me, like, that's the definitive version of it. So if you want to read about Witch Anne, you should go read that book. Alan also found, as far as I can tell, the only other written version. What? There's two? There are two. And this one was featured in a book called Polk County, North Carolina History, which is an admirably descriptive title. I love it. Yeah, it was published in 1983 by the Polk County Historical Association. And I'm betting that when they said that somebody from the Polk County Historical Association read a historical document that they were reading from this book. 
Okay. And as far as I can tell, it is the only other version that exists. And like I said, when I talked to Alan with the Polk County Public Libraries, as soon as I mentioned Witch Anne, he knew exactly what story I meant. Everybody there just knows this story. But it's again, it's a thing that like very few people have written down. So Polk County Historical Association published this book, The Polk County North Carolina History, in 1983. So that's when this version was you know, around that time, this version was written down by somebody and submitted to them for inclusion. And it is titled Witch Anne of Polk County. And I'm just going to read it because it's so different that I think if I attempt to summarize it, I'll sound like I'm making it up. Okay. So it's different. It's very different. Ooh. So it's titled Witch Anne of Polk County. And it reads, she was a real mean old woman. She wanted to become a witch. There are parts of this that I don't love, by the way, but... She wanted to become a witch, so she took a pot of boiling water and put a live black cat in it. Then she took it to the creek, and instead of going downstream with the flowing currents of water, it went upstream. This meant the cat was going to get back at her, and the way to get back at her was to turn her into a witch. That part, like, that's got to be something very specific to somebody's personal or, like, community mythology. Yeah. Her name was Anne And then it's spelled out with dashes between the letters S-H-E-P-H-A-R-D. If you say her last name, she'll put a spell on you and something terrible would happen. If she went off somewhere, she took a broom and drawed a ring around her house. If anybody got in that ring, the black cats wouldn't let you out. There were four men riding down the ridge. One remarked to the other one, we're on the Ann Ridge. Mr. Spicer spoke up and said, we'll use her head for a salt gourd. As soon as he had these words out of his mouth, Ann jumped off a bank and scratched a bit and nailed him almost to death. When she passed away, no one saw her for a few days. (laughs) When she died, nobody saw her. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Astounding. (laughs) In in part, I love this because it is clearly not written by a professional storyteller. Mm -hmm. And it's very vernacular and very just like verbal. And I like that a lot. But also it jumps around, to put it mildly. So (laughs) when she passed away, no one saw her for a few days. Mr. Wilson stopped by her house to get out of the rain. Okay. (laughs) He happened to look into the house. And this is definitely true because a lot of people have swore to it. And he saw her lying dead with a big black cat eating her Ah. went in to knock the cat off when he did it jumped back on and grew to be as large as a dog (laughs) again he knocked it off again it pounced back on and grew to be as large as a calf he ran and got some neighbors and all of them together couldn't keep the cat off they all ran and that's how the beast of bladenborough came to be (laughs) (laughs) yes that is my new head canon for the beast of bladenborough one cold raining windy night grandpa cersei put on his big heavy black coat He said something told him to get up and go somewhere. He wouldn't tell anyone where he was going. He took the shovel with him and left. The next morning, he came back hysterical. His coat was torn to shreds. All the buttons from his coat had been torn off. He would never tell anyone what had happened. He lived about one mile from the ridge. He is the only one who knew what did it, and he took it to his grave. I kind of love that because it's a completely man. It's 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 not necessarily in any way related. There was a road beside her ridge, so people would sometimes have to go there at night. However, lights would appear in front of the horses and spook them. The men would throw rocks at the light, holler at it, and try everything, but only in vain. The light would not go away. The horses would knock the men off, and the men would have to walk home without the horses. This happened to my grandfather, as it did everyone. Last year, a man went up there and found a dead dog lying there. Six months later, he went again, and the dog was still lying in the same position. It had not decayed or anything. Nobody ever hunts, rides, walks, or goes up there under any circumstances. They stay away. She would take a sharp pointed stick with her wherever she went. If she saw any children, she would poke them with the stick. So whenever the kids saw her, they would run into the woods. And then it's signed Brenda Gibbs. This is fascinating. This Brenda Gibbs person, and I looked up, you know, records and she existed. She's a real person. She submitted this to the Historical Association. She basically just like collected all the various stories that she'd heard about Witch Anne growing up in the neighborhood of Wildcat Spur and put them down on paper just sort of as they came to her and sent it into the Historical Association. And like that, as far as I can tell, other than this novel, is the only time anybody's ever written all those down. This is awesome. So we've got strong oral tradition. We've got historical fiction. We've got a collection of oral tradition that is a little more lost to time than other parts of the story. Confirmed that the ridge is real. Oh, yeah. Like, 
There's a picture of Wildcat Spur in the book. We know that people from the story existed. This is fantastic. I think that it would be a lot of fun <laughs> to go up there. Yeah. Go go looking for trouble. <laughs> Of course, I said her name like 400 times in the course of recording the first part of this. So I'm probably pretty out of luck. But I love the fact that like what this proves again is that there is so much of this kind of folklore out there. It's hyper local. Nobody has bothered to write it down. Nobody has bothered to record this stuff. And when we run across it, there's all this stuff in it that we don't really have context for. I don't know who Mr. Cersei was. I don't know who Mr. Wilson was. You know, I don't know who a lot of these people are, but clearly Brenda Gibbs, when she was writing it down, kind of expected her listener to know who these people were. So it's something that is told and retold in this like very closed system of like folklore transmission. It's cool. This is yeah. great. Thank you. I really you enjoyed to, it. Yeah. Thank, thank you. And thank you to the librarian and the historical association and just Gibbs. Yeah. Big thanks to Alan for the Polk County public libraries for finding it for me and sending it to me and to the historical association for publishing stuff like this. Mm -hmm. The table of contents includes different places within Polk County. And so it's kind of divided by location, but it's also divided up into, to some degree, like the types of stories, like there's an entire chapter called oddments and bitments. There's family histories and stuff like that. That's awesome. There's a copy of this book in the State Library in Raleigh, and there's a copy in the Polk County Public Libraries. Those are probably the only two copies that I know of that could be found. And I'm probably going to go over to the State Library at some point and just take a look at it. I requested that they digitize it, and they said they can't because it's too new. Basically, it's covered by copyright still. Gotcha. Copyright runs out in, in some in many decades. I will not be around for the time period when they are able to digitize it. Well, that's a dark way to end it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I will be. Let's be optimistic about science and the future. But I just found it really fascinating. Like, here's this little story tucked away. Mm -hmm. And there's so much to it that that something that brief can reference so many other things. And Pace can have written an entire novel by starting from this and reworking things. Anyway, that's the extra part. So much extra in this episode. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Stick around for the stinger, folks. That's the bit we'll after the, the longest end. stinger in history. It's going to be so great. Hope you're hungry. <laughs> it sounded like a threat. It's not a threat. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop recording. You've been listening to our King Carolinas. Thanks for joining us. If you liked it, give us a rating, leave a comment. If you didn't like it, send us an email and tell us why. If you're not wrong, we'll try to fix it. And if you're interested in award-winning speculative fiction, including science fiction, urban fantasy, and horror, find me, Michael G. Williams, at www.michaelgwilliamsbooks.com and check out Falstaff Books at falstaffbooks.com. If you'd like to pick up some Arcane Carolinas merch, look at behind-the-scenes info, pictures, videos, stuff like that, all the things that get cut, check out arcanecarolinas.com where you can get access to our Patreon, our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram, all that in one place, including the merch store. Buy a shirt. Clothe your body. Drape your body in our wares. <laughs> Be our living billboards. <laughs> Before... The author, Pace, read from his novel. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> this makes for terrible radio. <laughs> it is uh, Sonny the Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs bird. Oh. Dressed like Urkel. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So weird. It is so weird. That's really, really niche. Yes. There's a, who was that? Kellogg's, General Mills, yeah, whichever one. Whoever, whichever, whoever whichever one. They did these little, uh, I have completely derailed the conversation. I'm sorry. That wasn't my point. That's okay. <laughs> they did these little like stand up guys last year for Halloween where they did like monsters. So you get like Lucky the Leprechaun as a mummy or whatever. Sure. We got a bunch of them last year in the house because I'm a sucker for sugary cereal mm -hmm. and um this year they're doing 90s icons versions so there's like a boy band version of 
you know, pick your favorite cereal mascot. Sure. Uh, the Coo Coo Sam. R- right. Um, different icons from the 90s. And this is uh, the nerd is what it's called. So they can't call it. But you look at it and he's wearing like the overalls and he's got the red glasses. Yeah. And I'm like, right. oh, it's Urkel. It's it's the it's the Cocoa Puff bird as yeah. uh, as Urkel. And um, Captain what, Crunch is the boy band's creepy and probably <laughs> abusive manager. Oh, sorry. <laughs> El Capitan Crunch. Uh, Horatio Magellan Crunch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe this should stay in the episode. Yeah, I don't know. It, this might be the longest stinger in history. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I'm really excited. I probably won't get it because I don't think I'll eat enough cereal this fall to, to chase it down. But they're doing, they're bringing Wendell. Remember how there used to be three bakers from Cinnamon Toast Crunch? Yeah. Yeah. In the 90s, it like got whittled down to one and it was Wendell. <laughs> um, Outsourcing and cutbacks, man. You know, they, they broke up the union and then the bakery, <laughs> you know, the only one was left. The only one left was the scab. Wendell's a scab. Uh, wow. <laughs> Going real Long deep. tail of Reagan's administration touched everyone. <laughs> Going real deep in uh, Cinnamon Toast Crunch and Cereal Mascot <laughs> fanfic. Um, yeah, so Wendell survived uh, the rebranding in the 90s and he stuck around and... Uh, I think I don't know if he's I think he's gone now. Now I think it's just like cinnamon toast crunch and the mascot is like the little squares themselves. Ah, efficient. Uh, Yeah. Other mascots that changed over the years were the cookie crisp guys. You know, it used to be the cop chasing the robber and the dog. Yeah. Yeah, And I don't think they're there anymore. I think now it's like just the dog or like a dog is the the cookie crisp. So anyway. (laughs) <laughs> uh, for those of you listening, I had this little character and I'm on this laptop that has the worst camera placement. It's at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. Um, and I was playing with this toy and I realized that the tip of his little hair came onto the screen. So I just slowly made him stand. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so sorry. That's okay. I okay. Now I really want a retelling of the jungle, only it's about cinnamon toast crunch and the people, the, the characters who make it. And there's it's, like really creepy scenes of them like sweeping giant rivers of cinnamon <laughs> into the hole in the middle of the floor it's before they not, make the next batch. And then they organize as communists. It's not that the other bakers retired or got pushed out. It's that they fell into the industrial size. Um mixing bowl and they were exactly. actually mixed into a batch of cinnamon toast crunch there we go there's a horror tie all right <laughs> leave it in longest stinger ever happy halloween yeah charlie likes cereal yeah I, I, this is how country or really technically i guess this is how appalachian i am maybe i don't know every morning for breakfast i eat a slice of cornbread <laughs> i haven't bought i bought cereal in order to make breading like for uh, mm-hmm. a chicken recipe a couple of weeks ago and that was the first time i bought cereal in probably it probably 35 years we had um this definitely has to stay in as a stinger now because now we're just off on a tangent yeah. this is the type of gold you can expect as a patreon backer <laughs> <laughs> so we would get the uh malto meal cereal are you familiar with that i, I know that it exists but i don't really know it's like a about bag it. right so it's the same stuff. Like it's Cheerios, except yeah. that it's, you know, like it's not even store brand. Like it is its own it's brand. Just a competitor. Right. It's like the, um, the bulk version. So you get this giant bag and my mom would pour them into like Rubbermaid containers. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And we would have, you know, all that. And, uh, you know, Captain Crunch was a name brand. Captain Crunch was like a treat. I had to get that on my birthday. <laughs> and Lucky Charms was another one that I, I really liked. Those were my two jams. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we would get the, the Malto meal cereals in the bags and, uh, they'd be in the Tupperware in the pantry. And uh, it was always exciting to see the great volumes of cereal. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so I'm pretty <laughs> sure. <laughs> Hello and welcome to my ADHD. <laughs> You've really been pulled in like 40 different directions today already. So <laughs> I'm pretty what? sure that in that news article, 